And welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that's only available on horribly overpriced, big, fat, thick, open reel videotape. Uh, now, we consider ourselves to be pretty staunch video files here at the Archive. Uh, digital HD all the way, baby! But uh, we've never forgotten our roots. I mean, this show used to be shot on video. And indeed, we've uh, never forgotten the roots of home video either. And so with that, today we're going to take a look back at some of the forerunners to Betamax and uh, VHS and Laserdisc and DVD and all that. Sweet, lovely HD. Thank you, thank you. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure at this time to introduce... The first consumer-targeted videotape format came by way of the Sony CV-2000, CV meaning consumer video. The CV-2000 was introduced in the summer of 1965 at a cost of just under $700, plus $40 per tape, or about $5,500 grand total in 2013 dollars. This format only recorded in black and white on half-inch stock on one-hour open reel tapes and gave you a resolution of 200 lines, hence the slightly shrunken picture. The main issue with the CV-2000 was that there was no way to adjust the tracking of your picture, so unless you played it back on the same unit you recorded on, odds were extremely high that you were going to be watching a distorted, artifacts-laden mess. Welcome to Banjo in the Hollow, a program of traditional as well as contemporary folk music. Tonight, the sounds of bluegrass. Despite these flaws, the open reel Sony recorders lasted into the early 70s, when it was effectively replaced by their own U-Matic system. Hi, let's take a musical stroll back through those wonderful years of the fabulous 50s. The year is 1954. Around 1966, Ampex put out their own home videotape recorder, henceforth VTR, which recorded on one-inch tape. Like the CV-2000, it also recorded on reels running up to one hour, but despite having the ability to record in color, its nearly $1,500 price tag, plus $60 per reel of tape, kept it from being able to keep up with Sony's VTRs. In 1970, the easily mispronounced German electronics manufacturer Telefunken pitched an idea for a disc-based home video format to the brass at Britain's Decca Records, who owned the Telefunken name. This format was known as the Telefunken TED, TED meaning Television Electronic Disc. The notion of a disc-based format wasn't such a hard one to take. Indeed, Scottish inventor John Logie Baird had developed a disc-based video recording system that was used by the BBC in the 1930s. And over in America, RCA had been hard at work attempting to create their own video disc system since the mid-60s, which ultimately spawned the cheap but ineffective CED. While the Japanese came up with a similar, but less clunky, video high-density, or VHD, system. We're also offered for a closed number of users, as here for medics. As for Telefunken, they had developed a system by which they could quote-unquote etch audio and color video onto ultra-flexible PVC foil sheets 
that looked like sleeker 45 RPM records. To get everything to, for lack of a better term, encode properly, these sheets had to rotate at 1500 RPMs. The CED peaked at only 500. These discs were one-sided, suspended in mid-air by an air cushioning system, and gently read by a diamond stylus, which would get automatically sharpened after each play. Telefunken estimated that you could get about 100 hours of use out of one stylus. After a period of refinement, the Telefunken TED was released to the public on St. Patrick's Day 1975, the logic apparently being that you were too drunk to care when fighting with their system. Anyway, uh, the cost was 1,490 Dutch marks, or a little under $2,000. Adjusted for inflation, we're talking about $8,500. Anyway, each TED disc was enclosed in a paper sleeve to be loaded into the player. You would then crank the rotary knob along its lower half to load the disc, which would cause a series of rollers to grab onto and run the disc to its destination. Of course, the paper-thin disc would sometimes get caught, so instead of trying to create a better loading system, Ted's designers just made it easy to open the machine to retrieve your disc and try again. Upon successfully entering your disc into the player, you would then rotate the upper half of the aforementioned rotary dial, thereby winding up the machine to play your disc, almost as if it were a wind-up toy, the dial's arrow position would tell you at what point you were at on the disc. Earlier wisecracks aside, the picture and sound quality of these discs, at least upon first viewing, are quite nice, especially by 1975 home video standards. However, like the CED, the discs got worn down quite easily and the audio and video quality becomes wobbly and distorted after a while. But strangely enough, unlike the later CED, skipping is minimal and pausing to a still frame is actually somewhat doable. Japanese manufacturer Sanyo licensed the right to make an NTSC version of the TED for North America in 1976, but quickly pulled the plug, fearing that Americans were too attached to recordable tape-based formats. While well, that in a capacity of only 10 minutes per disc seemed rather undesirable. Telefunken pulled the plug on TED in 1977 and started manufacturing VHS decks for the European market the following year. Of course you get one button color on Sears 19 inch color TV, but you also get something a lot more important. Come, I'll show you. You get Sears testing for quality. Sears service available nationwide and most important. We'll take care of it. Sears reputation for dependability. With Sears 19 inch color TV, you get a lot more than one button color. Remember DivX? Well, meet its grandpappy, the Avco Cartravision. Hello, I am Cartravision. Come closer. I love an audience. Sony had already introduced the U-Matic in 1971, but there was still a little hole in the early cassette-based home video market. That being a certain lack of pre-recorded titles, despite Sony's best efforts. In June of 1972, Avco sort of rectified the situation with the Cartravision. Sears and Montgomery Wards began selling these home video cassette units in their stores at a cost of $1,600, nearly $9,000 in 2013. Foreshadowing the first Betamax unit three years later, the Cartravision was only available as a full TV video cassette console unit. Unlike the Betamax, the Cartravision never grew out of it. Well, save for some later homemade players. However, you could record up to 114 minutes on a blank tape, besting the U-Matic's then longest tape by nearly an hour. The magic and excitement the Sears Cartridge Television Center brings into your home is a facility for shooting your own video tapes. An optional feature of the Cartravision was a camera that wired back to the VCR that you could film your home movies on. 
as long as you didn't plan on moving more than eight feet. Microphone sold separately. For a few dollars, rent a full-length feature film and sit back and enjoy it. Now, when I said that the Cartravision was the precursor to DivX, I mean that you could rent tapes, just not normal tapes. Certain movie studios offered some films to rent, which had to be delivered and returned through the mail. These cartridges were always red in color, and you could only play these tapes once. No rewind or fast forward. Upon the tapes returned to Sears or wherever, the store would rewind the tapes with a special proprietary rewinder unit, then the tape would be sent back to Avco, and the whole process would start over again with the next customer. See, even back then, the film studios were paranoid. One issue with the Cartravision stemmed from the fact that the cartridge's reels were stacked on top of each other, running diagonally from one reel to the other, creating jamming and crumpling issues. But the biggest problem with Cartravision was that the quality was a noticeable step down from the U-Matic. This is in large part due to the skip field method of recording used on these tapes. When a signal was recorded to the tape, each frame of footage was put on one third of the tape, alternating between the thirds each frame. In all reality, only giving you 10 frames per second as opposed to the standard 30. This led to regular video jitter and audio dropouts. Of the titles actually available for sale, few were actual movies. Most Cartravision titles were documentaries, special interest stuff like cooking and fishing shows, and scoped versions of past major sporting events like recent Super Bowl games, usually starting around $7 per tape. Having said that, Cartravision does hold the honor, of sorts, of being the first home video format to release an adult film title. Still didn't help sales, though. Having lost millions in the project, Avco pulled the plug on the Cartravision in July of 1973, leaving behind massive backstocks of their machines, parts, and tapes. And most of the tapes had already decayed to the point of uselessness thanks to storing them in hot, humid southern warehouses. Now, while Sony's U-Matic never caught on as a consumer device, it did find a home in schools, industry, and of course broadcasting, lasting in the latter into the new millennium. Well, that's it for today's archive. Join us next time when I unveil my very own home video unit. Uh, it'll have these big, beautiful cartridges with a, a four-hour tape loop inside. Uh, you won't be able to rewind it, though. And uh, if you want to play back, uh, you'll have to like hold down eh, five or six buttons and uh, turn a couple of cranks. Uh, and if you want to record on it, you'll have to mash down most if not all the buttons at once, it won't be that many buttons. It'll be like, yeah, 15 to 20 of them. Uh, oh yeah, and you'll have to jam a small screwdriver in the side of the unit. And uh, you might have to turn the power on and off a couple of times. And you might have to perform a rain dance. But uh, it, it'll be cool. It'll be cool. Trust me. Hier aber führt es mit Hilfe eines Zauberwerks der Technik zu einem Happy End.